Test 13. Use the main menu icon in the upper right to browse back to the admissions information page. Did this menu behave as expected? Explain. No. This menu was confusing. This is super confusing right here. I have no idea what's going on with this menu. This is completely different than every other menu, every other time that I've clicked on that menu icon going through this test. This, to me, I realized that I completed the task successfully, but this to me is very confusing. I really hate it when sites do this, where the same icon does different things when you're on different pages, and it's like, this is just, it, this is overwhelming. Uh, this task was a two. I basically just got lucky. I completed it, but the menu did not behave as expected. All right, welcome. I wanted to show that example for uh, really to set up this talk. There are a lot of different things I'll talk about how that test was set up. Um, but with that video example, there were a couple of different things that we wanted to test. Uh, the entire team had arrived at a lot of conclusions early on. They wanted to use uh, a hamburger menu and apply that to the desktop. So that caused, we had the hypothesis that that would cause some difficulty in people finding the menu. There were also some complex navigation things that we wanted to introduce in that navigation menu that I wanted to validate uh, whether our assumptions are correct or not. So before we get into all of that, why do we even conduct usability tests? And before I even talk about why we conduct usability tests, I wanted to define what a usability test is. You've probably more commonly heard the term user testing as opposed to usability testing. Uh, user testing is typically what somebody calls a usability test. Uh, but that's a little bit erroneous, and some of my mentors corrected me early on, because ultimately we're modifying the usability of something that we're working on with the product. We're, we're not modifying our users. So even though we're testing with users, we have the ability to affect the usability of the product we're working on. And that's because if we build something that's unusable, and our audience member, our user, they break it, or they become confused, or they have some other difficulty, that's on us. It's our fault if our product is unusable. And again, we are in charge of fixing that usability. We're not replacing our users, or at least hopefully we're not replacing our users. So we use ability test because user focus is best practice for a lot of reasons. Our instinct when we go into a project, into design and features, is to imagine people who are like ourselves, but in reality, most of our users are nothing like us in any way. Uh, and this is something I got out of the Eric Meyer keynote uh, recently in the North, Northeast Ohio WordCamp. And I would recommend watching that video. It's on WordPress.tv right now. And he points out that who we test with and who we consider when we're evaluating our product really defines who we care about. So if we're not thinking about accessibility, if we're not thinking through stress cases and all of those uh, extreme users who might be using our product, then ultimately we're saying we don't care about them. We test for a lot of different reasons, not just because it's best practice. Uh, we test to validate our assumptions. So when we start off with our requirements gathering, a lot of people give us a lot of ideas about what a product needs to be, how our users will use it, and even who our user is. Um, but that's a lot of stereotypes. We get a lot of false information that we don't know is false until we use ability test. And by learning those things, we inform our design decisions. And it's not just about being smarter. Uh, we as practitioners, it helps us if we decide a button needs to be a specific color or a specific size or in a specific place. If we just say, well, it needs to be that because I like it that way, that's subjective. But if we have usability studies to back up our design decisions, it makes it easier for us to argue with uh, other decision makers. 
we do it to show success over time. So hopefully we're running usability tests at multiple stages throughout a project, and we're actually seeing improvement through the life of a project. So we might test something early on, run that same test on a different prototype later on, and hopefully we're seeing improvements over the things that we've tried to correct. And ultimately we're doing it to grow as a practitioner. So over time, the more usability testing you do in your projects, the more equity you earn. You learn things like in that video I just showed that the, the hamburger icon, even if it's difficult on mobile already, it's even more disastrous when you put it onto a desktop site. So you can reference usability tests you ran in the past when you are debating specific decisions that you've made in an interface. But I'm not a researcher, where do I start? And that's why we are here today. I'm Anthony Paul, I'm Director of UX at an agency in Baltimore. Uh, I've been designing, developing, developing, and running all kinds of usability tests for many, many years now. So this is your grocery list as you get into usability testing for the first time. You're going to need a handful of things uh, to make sure you're ready. And the first of those is a project goal. Just with any science practice, you need some kind of hypothesis or something that you want to learn to be able to learn that thing. You don't just usability test, just usability test. Just as hopefully you're not building a website just to build a website. More likely, you have a business goal in mind. That goal is to get more customers, to sell more things, to gain brand exposure. You have a goal that is measurable in some way, so when you go into uh, building a, a website, rebuilding a website, or running a usability test, you have an idea of something you want to accomplish. Then against that thing you're trying to accomplish, you need your test strategy. So what do I want to learn? Well, how am I going to learn it? And that's going to affect uh, how many tests you run, the type of test you run. So depending on the type of thing you're trying to learn, that will inform you as to what type of usability test you need to run. You'll need a prototype to test against, so we're not just talking to a participant that's an interview or a focus group, but we actually need something for them to interact with. That could be any fidelity, it could be a sketch on a piece of paper, or it could be a, a staged version of the website right before you launch it, anything in between, every, le every level of prototype. Uh, testing facility, so if it's on a one-on-one in, a one -on -one in-person usability test, then you might be sitting with that physical person, so you need the room, you need your devices, you need your recording materials, or it could be the opposite end. It could be a remote test that you're running with online software, and we'll talk uh, about that in my talk here. And then, of course, you need those participants. Uh, I note here that demographics may or may not be relevant. Generally, when you're usability testing, demographics are not relevant. Uh, if something is universally understood by all of your audiences, then demographics just introduce stereotypes. Uh, however, there are situations where demographics do become important. If you're building something for a specific audience, for example, a stay-at-home parent, and I say parent because I, I wouldn't want to say it needs to be a stay-at-home mother, but if I have something for a stay-at-home parent, then that gives me a certain demographic. That demographic is defined by them having a certain number of children. Uh, maybe I'm demographically selecting to a specific income level, um, but ideally you are only using demographics when it's absolutely required based on the type of thing that you're trying to communicate. So project goals, why are we even working on this project? They come in all shapes and sizes, so depending on the type of business you are, your project goal is going to be very different. A university, for example, will often have a goal of getting more students in the door. So their goal for a redesign might not just be that broad goal of getting more students, but what is it the students are having a difficult time with today that we want to fix in that new site? So in this example, a goal might be, I want students to really quickly and really easily find programs that they identify with. So they immediately make that brand connection and say, okay, I want to go to this school. An online store might have a problem with shopping cart abandonment. So they would set their goal as reduce shopping cart abandonment. Or a nonprofit wants to drive more donations. Goals shouldn't be prescriptive. All of those you'll note talk about what the end result is. It's not a design decision. So a good example here, back to that university example, 
is to say I want students to quickly find specific degree information. My goal would not be list all degree options on the home page. That's a design recommendation. And I can't really measure whether that is successful or not because ultimately I don't know what I'm trying to accomplish. And it's okay to have multiple goals. In fact, usually when you go into a website redesign, you'll have multiple goals. And thus, you'll have multiple goals when you're actually testing against that redesign. So with that university example, they might need to communicate the school brand has a really positive student experience. Talk about culture. So that really leans on the messaging of the product. Uh, you want to allow those prospective students to quickly find those programs. I've mentioned that a couple of times. And then ultimately, once they find those programs, there's another goal of we need them to actually contact somebody or request information and take that next step. So I have these three goals, but I want to make sure I'm prioritizing them as well. So how do I put together a test strategy? Uh, ultimately, our test strategy, the goal of our test strategy against the goal of our project is really to get the maximum benefit out of any tests that we run. Because more likely than not, our project has constraints. We have a specific amount of budget, we have a specific number of hours that we're allowed to allocate to testing. A lot of times that number is really small. So we want to make sure we're getting the most out of any usability test we run. And because of that, we need to know those constraints, but we also want to know what our areas of problems are. We're not going to be able to test everything in our usability test. Now, we'll still learn a little bit about everything, whether we want to or not, and for good and for bad, we'll get feedback on all the things. But we want to make sure we're focusing on those areas of problems. So we have a handful of questions to figure out what our project constraints are. We want to know what our test budget is. We want to know how many sets of tests can we run throughout the life of a project. And in a given test, typically, unless you're uh, running something like a, like a tree jack test where uh, you, it's an IA test where information architecture where you sort all the things in the menu that can be a quantitative test that you actually issue to however many thousands of people and you get back a chart that shows commonalities that's a specific type of test but if I'm talking about putting a website in front of somebody and getting feedback based on a list of tasks uh, the industry number is 8 to 12 participants before you start losing uh, return on investment so after about eight participants, you start learning the same things over and over from all of the participants. And if you spend a couple of hours analyzing the findings from each participant, uh, you just find that you're not learning new things. You're just watching more videos about people complaining about the same things. You also need to know who's in charge of recruitment. There are many times, I work for an agency, and there are many times when uh, that has been glossed over, and then you get to the point where, okay, I'm ready to schedule my tests. Do you have my users? Oh, we don't have any users. Uh, we don't have a list or anything. And then suddenly we have to figure out where we're getting those participants from. So establish who's in charge of recruitment. Do we have demographic requirements? I mentioned ideally you don't, uh, because for most things, whether an icon is understood or not, whether a navigation pattern is understood or not, those are universal problems in general. Um, but establish whether you have demographic requirements. And then are the participants local? Uh, usually that will inform one of the next steps, and that is determining whether you're doing in-person testing or remote testing. So focusing on the hairiest problems. There are a broad spectrum of problems that are hairy. Uh, at one end of the spectrum, it could be a problem with too much content. So if today's website has too many pages, the menu is really complex, nobody can find anything, I know that's a big problem that needs to get solved in this redesign. Well, that tells me that if I only have one usability test in the entire life of the project, I probably want to test that really early. I want to test that how we're organizing our content makes sense before I get into too much interface design. Because I don't want to go through that whole design process, usability test at the end, have everybody be confused, and then I'm not able to isolate whether that was a navigation problem or it's because our colors or our iconography or something else didn't make sense. At the other end, it could be that our primary goal is brand perception. And again, if I only had one test, then I would need to do that as close to launch as possible because I'm testing against 
our messaging, our photography, our videos, the, even the interactive feedback that buttons give really communicate our brand. So there are a lot of different testing options when you're deciding what type of test you need to run uh, with the usability test. Moderated versus unmoderated. Moderated means I'm acting as a moderator live with the person, so I have a script, I'm walking through that script. Uh, that has its own pros and cons. Uh, the biggest cons are it introduces a lot of tester biases and also participant biases where somebody's trying to be your friend and they're trying to make you feel good about yourself because your design is very personal to you. Uh, that's less of an issue with an unmoderated test where a system is facilitating. Uh, however, moderated does have the benefit of if I have a participant who's doing really well and they're just bl blowing through this, this test, I can start improvising questions in the middle where I can ask them to elaborate on specific things I find, find interesting. And so I can get a lot of really rich anecdotal information out of a test that otherwise, with unmoderated, I would have missed out on that opportunity. And then the inverse is true. If somebody's having a very hard time with a test, I can also get them to move on to the next task and make sure they complete on time. In-person versus remote. Uh, typically, if you're doing a moderated test, uh, you're, you, you can do either in-person in or remote. If uh, you're doing an unmoderated test, more likely you're doing a remote. It doesn't really make sense for you to set up a physical lab and sit on the other side of a window and watch somebody without moderating because that artificial environment also affects the test. So, if you're doing an unmoderated remote test, that probably has the lowest bias. Somebody is probably at home, they're working on a website or on a device of their own choosing, and they're using it most naturally. Desktop versus mobile is also a consideration, depending on the type of prototype you have. Ideally, you're able to test both desktop and mobile devices, but it really depends on where you are in the process uh, in your project, and it also depends on the types of things that you're trying to learn. Well, let's look at an example here. So if I understand my cons constraints are, I have a very tight budget. I only have one test that I can run throughout the life of my project. I have those eight to 12 participants. My participants are not local, and I actually don't have a list at my disposal, or the client doesn't have a list at their disposal. I, I know that I need to use some kind of automated recruitment. So that tells me I'll probably end up using an online system, and it'll be an unmoderated test. If my hairiest problem is I have too much content and things are hard to find, that tells me I probably want to test early on early prototypes. Um, but I still have that other hairy problem of I also want to understand brand sentiment. So I'm probably going to find somewhere in the middle of the project where I feel like I'm testing that hairiest content problem uh, as early as possible, but I'm also getting a sense of what this brand how the brand is responding to my specific audience group. So my decision here, and I'm not sponsored by either of these products, but these are two that I've used to accomplish this task. Uh, Try My UI is an online system. It's similar to usertesting.com if you have access to that, um, but the pricing model for Try My UI is much more friendly to small businesses and freelance practitioners because you actually order each video a la carte. So that sample that I, I showed you in the beginning is a Try My UI video. I think it's $35 per participant. So if you had 10 of those, it would be $350 to order those. Envision is an application that many of you have probably used, um, but it, help, it, it's a, it allows you to deploy a, a live URL that you can send to somebody, and so you don't even have to use it through the recruitment system. You could just send a link to your grandmother if you wanted her to use it. Uh, but Envision has a free model for you. You can put in sketches, wireframes, uh, Photoshop or sketch mockups, uh, really anything you want. And it allows you to draw these little hot spots that link to different pages. And I can show you what that looks like. So Envision from the administrative interface lets you draw all these little rectangles. You import all of your flat images. And then each of those hot spots, you're able to define, OK, if I click on plan a visit, then go to the plan a visit screenshot. And so as a participant, 
it looks like a website, even though it's not 100% like a website, but it allows me to click around. It even gives me some complex interactive stuff where I can have menus slide in and I can have some interactive pieces there. So for my script, as I go into testing, I understand my goals, so if I, I need to figure out now how to turn these into tasks that I tell somebody to do. So back to that example of, okay, my goal is I want my students to quickly find the program of interest. So I need to pose a research question. Well, what do I want to know? How do I rephrase that as a question? Does the program finder behave as expected? Now the program finder in this context is something that we created in the middle of the page that allows you to select topics of interest to then find a program of interest to you that we offer. I then need to turn that into a task. So if my question was, does the program finder behave as expected, then I need to tell somebody at some point in the test, okay, now go back to the home page and specifically use the program finder to find information about a degree in a specific field. I have three tasks here that I'm showing you, and that's because what I intentionally did is from the home page, I asked them to find information about a specific program. In this case, it's nursing. Because I want to find out their preference first. I want them to either use the menu, either use the program finder, or either go anywhere they want to in the site to find this information. So I leave it open-ended first. And then later on in the test, I write in another task that says, okay, now go back to the home page and use this specific part of the page to do something. Because I want to evaluate the usability of that piece. And what's interesting about that is you'll find later on in the test, if you've done that a couple of times throughout the test, you might actually find that your participant's uh, preference has changed. So after they've used the different routes, they might have started with one navigation mechanism like the main menu and they actually like the program finder better and they start using the program finder for everything including content that doesn't even live in it. So how do I format that test script? What I do here is in just a Google Doc, I, I outline all of my questions in order and I weave in multiple goals. I have them all kind of thatched together. I'm not trying to uh, I don't want my participant to explicitly be able to predict what the next task is, but I also sort of want to map to a natural progression through the information. What is it that you understand about the website first? What, is, what are your eyes drawn to? Uh, now, if you were looking for this thing or that detail, do all of these different things in different orders. And then when I capture all of those questions into a list, uh, what I do for my personal self is on the side there, the expected, for each of those tasks, I guess all of the different ways that somebody might look for that content because I want to validate that my prototype supports that. Because a lot of times I'll take those designs from the designers, I'll put them into InVision, and then if I think through a specific task, I think, well, somebody might click on this thing looking for that, and I don't want that to feel like it's broken. So I want to account for all of those navigation patterns as much as possible in my prototype. This is less of an issue. If, you have, if you're testing really at the end of the project and you have what is almost a live site, uh, or even if you're testing against today's site, that's always a good option as well. So uh, you might want to start with the benchmark of how hard is it for people to accomplish these important tasks on today's site. Go ahead and pilot test it. So once you put that script together, the last thing you want to do is order a bunch of usability tests and have everybody fail on the first task because of the way you've worded it or, or something. Uh, the goal here is to make your script as natural as possible, but you also need to encourage enough success for people to progress through the test because your goal, of course, is to get as much feedback as possible. and You don't want people hitting brick walls. So a lot of times I'll run a pilot test with a coworker who hasn't been on the project yet, or with a friend, or somebody who's completely external, and I'll learn some things, like the test takes too long, uh, maybe I have a specific time window, or they get hung up on the way I phrased something, like uh, earlier I used the term IA, and then I realized, well, maybe not everybody in here knows that IA means information architecture. So if that's a perfect example where you might use an industry term that somebody doesn't really understand in the test. 
and it ends up being a problem with the test, not a problem with the interface. All right, so web, web applications. Uh, for trying my UI, just to give you a sense of what this looks like, once I have my script, I have that list of questions. I, I load all of those into my test. I have some options. Uh, so try my UI gives you a couple of uh, useful things. You put those tasks in, and then one at a time, the user walks through those tasks. They self-rate whether they felt it was easy or difficult on that scale of seven that we saw in the intro video and then they mark whether they felt like they were com completed successfully or not. Uh, and then the follow-up to that, you also can ask up to four survey questions. What was the worst thing you experienced, the best thing? And you can customize those questions. So the test, the, the end result is for each user, you have this 20-minute video. You get to watch the entire thing. They have that audio uh, recording where they vocalize everything that they've been thinking about. Across all of the tasks in your test, you see a, across all of the users who walked through the test, uh, which tasks took the longest on average, which were perceived as the hardest or the easiest on average, uh, and which tasks did they actually complete or not complete. Um, the, the completions are self-evaluated, so they're not always correct, and I'll get to that in a moment. Because what you'll end up with is you'll create a spreadsheet, and I'll show you a zoomed-in example here, but basically every row is a specific user that I ran the prototype against, and then every column, I have a notes column that corresponds with a specific task. Because what I want to do then is as I'm watching that video, I'm taking notes on observances for each person. So under the review of the homepage, I'm taking note of anything interesting they say about their perception of the brand, um, what is it they looked at first, uh, were they confused about anything, what were they most drawn to, did anything offend them. And I, I walk through that whole thing left to right in the spreadsheet with that particular user. Because later on, that allows me then to walk down a specific column and start finding patterns. I see this many people had difficulty with this thing, or this many people felt a specific way. I'm also taking that uh, system usability score. That's what the 1 to 7 was. Uh, usually it's 1 to 5, but in this system it's 1 to 7, where somebody says the task was easy or hard on that scale. Uh, and in those columns, I'm putting in what they marked as that usability score. And then I'm also correcting whether they were successful or not in that task. Because what I ended up doing is I created two different averages. I averaged uh, the overall perception of that task. But then I also wanted to average only the people who successfully completed the task. Because everybody who doesn't complete the task is going to mark it low. So I want to know of the people who did complete it, what was their perception, in addition to the overall average. And then lastly, I have those survey questions that I get all the answers for, and I pull them into the end column here. So uh, I know a handful of people walked in late, so I'm going to quickly play that other video, because I have a few minutes to do so. This is the video that I uh, played at the beginning, so it'll be a repeat. But it'll show you what that artifact looks like. No. Test 13. Use the main menu icon in the upper right to browse back to the admissions information page. Did this menu behave as expected? Explain. No. This menu was confusing. This is super confusing right here. I have no idea what's going on with this menu. This is completely different than every other menu, every other time that I've clicked on that menu icon going through this test. This, to me, I realized that I completed the task successfully, but this to me is very confusing. I really hate it when sites do this, where the same icon does different things when you're on different pages, and it's like, this is just, it, this is overwhelming. Uh, this task was a two. I basically just got lucky. I completed it, but the menu did not behave as expected.
All right, so back to that question. Why do we conduct usability tests? Ultimately, we conduct usability tests because the price of light is less than the cost of darkness. Uh, it costs us a lot less early on or even a couple times in a project to run a few usability tests like that set of 10 for $350 and then a few hours for me to analyze that data. For me to learn a lot really early on than it does for me to learn very expensively later on. So if you were in the design talk that preceded me immediately with that license plate example, uh, they had to halt the presses and pull something off because uh, there was some inappropriate imagery on a license plate that was being printed. Uh, that's something that if they had run some kind of usability test early on in a project, uh, they would have found that out earlier. And with a website, it's the same way, especially if you're in any website that does conversions of some kind, e-commerce, uh, you don't want to find that there's shopping cart abandonment because uh, the checkout button is missing. You know, that's the type of thing that could be caught very easily and very cheaply. I will warn you, though, that the first time you run a usability test, your website or anything you're building is very precious to you. You have a lot of feelings, especially if it's something you built you know, or your designers. And so you'll watch that usability test, and you'll be thinking, this is a glass of water. How do people not understand how it works? Uh, but if you can get past that, and if you can remember everything that I've talked about here, including that price of light is less than the cost of darkness, remember that all of that feedback that you're getting is very valuable, and ultimately it will make what you're building uh, much better than it would have been. Thank you. A uh, couple of links here. If you would like to follow me on Twitter, my personal site, adp.rocks, or I have a couple emoji domains, thundersnow.ws and pizzarat.ws. Thank you. And it looks like I have eight minutes for questions. Exactly. Uh, so your best course, the, the question was, how do I dis distinguish, um, really it comes down to the st statistical significance. Because with 8 to 10 or 8 to 12 participants, or even 100 participants, it's probably not very representative of actual percentages across a really large audience. It's too small of a sampling. Uh, this is qualitative feedback that you're getting. So if somebody in this group is seeing something, there is a chance that they are the only person in the world who will have that problem. But more likely than not, if one person finds something, it's actually a pretty high probability that it is a much larger issue. But you want to ideally measure that against some kind of quantitative information as well. And that's where, if I was working on an information architecture problem, I might also look at running a tree jack test. I mentioned that earlier. Um, I think it's optimalsort.com slash tree jack. You can put in your entire menu system as an outline. Uh, and it's, it's, it gives you a URL as well. And you give people tasks that are, if you were looking for the school of nursing, uh, where would you expect to find that? And they walk through this IA tree and then they mark the item that they think that content would live within. There are no pages, it's only the information architecture tree. That's a quantitative study because I could have 10,000 people do that and then I get a chart of all the most common paths for all the most common things. Uh, so I would want to pair that with my qualitative study. Surveys are also quantitative studies. So with the brand sentiment thing, if I could issue a survey monkey, for example, and give back a bunch of data, uh, I can measure the two against each other. So a usability test is not going to give you all the answers. You, it, it's only going to highlight possible problems and possible opportunities. So you're going to have to go through there with your client, if you're working with a client, or if you are your client, and you'll have to decide which things do I want to try to fix, and then later on evaluate whether you have fixed those or not. Um, ultimately, there is always that chance, and that's where 
this should be an iterative process. It should be that ideally you're testing at different points on different prototypes. You're learning new things. You're pivoting. You're seeing whether you were successful or not. Any other questions? <laughs>